Zooty, Welcome back. Zoot something. Dude, if I did you have any clue that when Lanier did that, however long ago that that was ever going to come back? <laughs> I, Didn't you say that that was like something from like Bill Mummy's real life band or something? No, that was uh, Zab Zabagabi. Zabagabi, that's right. That's yeah. Right. But, when but there's that music. meme and there's stuff. The zooty zoot zoot. Yeah, that well, apparently. That's a, that's a gif. Like I use yeah. that a lot. Zooty zoot zoot. Yeah. Here we are. Here yeah. we are. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Episode. I am eager. Let's just say this before, and, I, and I'm eager to dive right in. But I, I can't wait. I definitely have feelings on this one. I, I'm dying to know your feelings on this one. I'm, I'm dying to know why you're dying to know my feelings on this. I'm one. just, I'm just curious. It's one of those things. It's like a reaction video, like our reaction videos, where it's like, hey, people are watching us watch this because they want to know yeah. what we think of it. They have feelings on it. They want to know yeah. our feelings. I have feelings on this. I want to know yours. Well, if you watch my Brent Watches video, which you don't until after we record this, yeah. you would know. But uh, with that, why don't we go ahead and jump into this? Hey, you guys out there, welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Jeff and I are recording an audio podcast. You know, it goes out on all those things. You guys are way cooler because you do the YouTube version. And this, then because you come over here to YouTube and watch us, you get the behind the scenes. This is the unedited version. Like we record, this gets slapped up onto YouTube and you guys party with us. That being said, you guys also get all the mistakes, you get the flubs, you get the outtakes as they happen, which is hilarious at times and infuriating at others, I'm sure. Uh, that means you also get the rabbit trails. That means you get the the stuff we talk about that doesn't actually make it into the whole show. And honestly, the community here, the people that comment and all that sort of stuff, way cooler. As you do comment down below as part of this community, please remember, no spoilers. We would appreciate that a lot. While you're here, please like, subscribe, share this video all that sort of stuff. And if you do want more of that community thing, check out our Patreon where you can get access to different groups and levels, which is awesome. Jeff, if you're ready, let's go. Well, really quick, if you're one of those people who takes off as soon as I hit the outro, our little shtick gets down the outro, you should go back and listen to the end of last week's because in the audio version, we actually took a big chunk of our post conversation, uh, yeah. put it in the audio itself because we yeah. thought that was really important. So there's a lot of value. If you're here on YouTube, we love you here, but also stick around. Usually, usually the after stuff for whatever the after stuff is, is like, Hey, here's all the stuff I didn't say that I wanted to say. Like I just, it, it was in my notes and I just never had a chance to say it. Sometimes we're just joking around, but this one was like, uh, actually, this is what we should have said while we were yeah. recording. Yeah. yeah. So worth it. Hey, yeah. let's do it. Let's do it. At least I should have buffed him just once. Humans form communities. And from that diversity comes a strength. Now get the hell out of our galaxy! The year is 2024. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5. For, for the, the first, first time. time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And we're watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you, the one who is. It's a great shtick, Brent, but if the people are listening on the audio version, they're not going to get it. Well, but it, Penn, Penn and Teller were in this episode, and you're doing the Penn thing. I'm doing the Teller thing. I mean, I know. It's, you know. It's a lot of fun on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, hey, guys. Welcome to the show. Uh, Jeff and I. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who are searching for the important messages that Babylon 5 is delivering in its own unique way. And we're looking for those Babylon 5 messages, not Star Trek messages. And because we're not looking for the Star Trek ones, and this is not a Star Trek podcast, we play the rule of three. This is a game that limits us to no more than three references to Star Trek per episode in total. That's it. Three. three. Uno, dos, tres. No substitutions, exchanges, or refund. <laughs> you know, Jeff, I'm pretty sure last week I blew through all of my references, all of our references. We didn't get a buzz once last week, though. No, because you really, I mean, they, they weren't, they were, well, I think a couple times you're even like, well, this is a Star Trek and also, and also, and also. So it really wasn't a Star Trek thing. But if we do make Star Trek references, what sound should they hear out there? Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful sound. And it's this. It's not annoying at all. No, not even a little bit. 
Right. Because while this is definitely not a Star Trek podcast, Jeff, those references do tend to get shoved in more so from time to time. And that just happens. Although we are better because we used to do three each and now we just do three total, which is awesome. So that's a game we play. You know, another game we like to play. What's that? It's a game called time to pay the piper. That's right. This is part of the show where we look back at what last week's prediction about this week's episode was going to be. And we see just how right we were or how absolutely wrong we were. Jeff, I don't think that there is a single thing that we have gotten feedback on more than we have on people's responses to our predictions. For real. This is the spot. So let's take a look back at what we said last week, uh, that this week's episode was going to be. How close were you? What did you say? I thought that uh, Regent on Centauri Prime was going to die and Londo was going to be set up to become Emperor. Not at all. That's two we goose did, eggs. We, here, here's the thing. I'm going to give you like 0. .001 just because we got a mention of you're the soon-to-be Emperor, Londo Malari. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. What did you think? Well, I said that if this one doesn't involve masks with skulls and all that sort of stuff painted on them, I'm going to riot. And I'm happy to say I do not have to riot because that was definitely, definitely in this episode. I said that this was going to be something where people are celebrating this. It's going to be another culture on Babylon 5, which I nailed that. And that we were going to be seeing the ghost of the past. We we're going to be honoring those from the past. We're not really honoring, but seeing ghosts from the past. Nailed that. However, I said, this is, this is where the Brent getting specific kills it. Like if I stay general, I'm okay, but I got specific on it. I said, telepaths are going to get involved and screw with people's minds and make them think that they're seeing stuff that maybe they really aren't. We didn't even see telepaths in this one really at all. I also said, there's going to be no Lanier. And he a thousand percent showed up at the very beginning of the episode. So, you know, looking real suave in his black black outfit with the little badge on it's a good looking analyst shock like it, it, he wears it well he does but he still looks like he's wearing his dad's robe like i just i don't know yeah we'll dive but into all that i will say uh, he does look good he's just yeah i was gonna say king is back the king is back i'll let you wear the crown on this one but you got specific gonna give you 0. 0.8 on this I'll one take it. i'll take it we had a programming note that we, a little housekeeping we wanted to bring oh, up. Oh, yeah, 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 I forgot. <laughs> we just talked about this all of three minutes ago, and I forgot about it already. <laughs> it's going to be fine. This is going to be a great, great, smooth episode. But we've had a lot of comments on YouTube, like on the, the just the, the various videos coming up on Patreon, on our Discord, emails, things like that, on the two words that plagued us for the first season, especially and into the second, then kind of tapered off. But those two words, Brent, are viewing order. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, uh, we are well aware that the today's episode chronologically falls into like right between like episodes four and five or something like that. It was like right after, what was it? Learning curve. And I think learning curve. A review from a gallery, I think is when it from the gallery landed. and learning curve. Like it kind of fits in, in there. We understand that. Um, we got out of order and we actually, are, we, we have a friend, John, who has a list who, who kind of helps us mitigate that kind of stuff. We stopped looking at that list a while ago be, for two reasons. One, because we made an executive decision to save the movies until the end. And so we, we weren't following that, but then honestly, the the order that they come up on on the on iTunes or on mm -hmm. on Amazon is the same order that John kept giving us. I think we just got out of the habit and we didn't really look as we were going forward. And yeah, we saw some things out there, but we just sort of kept moving at a good pace. And we we're just saying we know that it belongs back there. I think it's fine. Yeah, well, depending <laughs> on who you talk to, it belongs episode. back there, or there's people who think it was going to be later. Here's the bottom later, line. Later, yeah, yeah. We made the choice, right? Like, we made that yeah. choice to on the movies. That got us off track. We're going to stick to this, right? That's It's the next one in the app. That's yeah. with, with the iTunes thing. That's We're, we're going to keep following that. We're going to go through. Yeah. Um, here we are. And thank you and, for your care and your input. Yes. and And frankly, with this particular episode... Having now watched it, I'm still kind of like, uh, it didn't really matter. Yeah. You could have watched this. Like, in fact, I said to you just just before we came on mic, like, this could have been like episode two of the season 
it feels like. Like it just it's so non time committal. Yeah, there's like one little line and little thread in Londo's piece that it can't happen after a certain point. We don't know when that point is, but it can well, happen before most any of them. It couldn't happen after Londo actually became emperor. There you go. Yeah. Outside of that, yeah. Have had it. Soon as Lockley's on board and he's not emperor, anywhere in there. But Brent, we're starting to dive into some specifics on this episode. So before we get too far on that, for those who haven't seen it before, here we are spoiling all the good stuff, right? Before we get uh, too far ahead, Brent, can you tell us what Day of the Dead was all about? Well, hey, do you remember when the Drazi had their thing about purple and green and we learned a bit about their culture? Well, it's time to learn a bit about the culture of another alien species. This time... It's the Bracari, or is it the Bracari? Well, whatever. Uh, they seem to say it both ways. Anyway, they apparently have like a single comet in their system, and it passes by like once every 200 years. And when it does, it signals a Day of the Dead festival, which actually happens at night, but we can't call it Night of the Dead for reasons. Anyway, apparently there's this thing where people laugh, they tell stories, they have feasts, and rumor has it sometimes weird stuff happens but that's all just stories though right so when the Bracari ambassador quote unquote buys a bit of babylon 5 just for a single night it's not renting though it's actually buying but he's going to give it back the next morning lockley doesn't really think too much of it she honors his request and that's when all hell breaks loose because now that part of the station is considered Bracar. Like their home world. It's part of their home world, sovereign land. And on that night, an unexplained phenomena happens with absolutely no scientific or fictional or scientific fictional explanation. They even say so in the episode. Sometimes it's just good to have a bit of a mystery. And so we move on. And several of our characters are visited by their ghosts. First up is soon to be Emperor Londo Malari, who is visited by somebody that actually really warmed my heart for him to get to see again, Adira Tyree. It's the true love of Londo's life. They have sex, apparently a lot of it. And she comments on him being the ruler of 40 billion Centauri. But Londo says he'd give it all up just to be with her. Garibaldi is visited by Elizabeth Derman. Don't remember her? It's because we knew her as Dodger. Remember her? Yeah, no real mention that Garibaldi is married because no one remembers Lise either. Dodger tries to sleep with Garibaldi again, and Garibaldi puts her off again, and by morning, she's gone. Garibaldi has missed his shot again. But he's married, so good on him, right? Captain Lockley is visited by Captain Lockley is visited by Zoe, her little sister. Oh, no, no, wait, I'm sorry. That's an old girlfriend. Oh, was she just a roommate? Uh, it's probably a girlfriend. Man, not really super clear, but she was definitely from back in the day when Lockley was a little bit of a wild child. Drug riddled, poor, cold, party, party, party. Lockley apparently found Zoe's body many years ago and always wondered if her death was on purpose or was it an accident. Lockley winds up giving us a bit of her backstory, how she got clean, worked her way up through the military. And before Zoe leaves in the morning, she gives Lockley a message. We'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, there's Lanier. Because, hey, he's back on the station just for the Day of the Dead so he can learn about it. And who does he get visited by? Morden. Yes, that Morden. With a cool new haircut, which makes his face way less punchable. He tells Lanier that he is going to betray the Rangers. Lanier scoffs. And that's pretty much the end of that whole storyline. Well, as for that message that Zoe brought to, to Lockley, well, turns out that message was for Captain Sheridan or I'm sorry, President Sheridan, that message was from Kosh. A message that says, when the long night comes, go back to the end of the beginning. Whatever that means. 
And well, that's pretty much the end of the episode. By morning, everything's back to normal. Jakar regrets moving out of his quarters for the night because he kind of is curious what he would have seen. And he notes that everyone seems to be more at peace, which is weird because I didn't get that vibe at all. Oh, yeah. And uh, Penn and Teller, who've been on the station uh, as Rebo and Zudi, they leave because that's the grand total of the impact that they've had on the story during their time here. Jeff, what did you make of this episode, Day of the Dead? Right out of the gate, I'm just going to read one of my notes here because you, sir, are wrong. You're very wrong about a very key thing here. It is, it is a sin to have Morden's hair looking like that. That man has been given a gift, and this is an affront to God that they made him look like this. <laughs> I don't think they made him look like that. I think the actor just came over from whatever he was doing post Morden time and was like, "Yeah, I'm not growing out my hair." Here. That's, that's so disappointed. I miss. Oh, his hair is so great. But, but I it does the, make his face entirely less punchable. That's true. That's very true. Really Much more, uh, much more just like I could hang out with this guy kind yeah. of a look. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But dude, I spent at least about 11 minutes of this episode with my head in my hands, almost in tears. Penn and Teller? Like that, from, that's- I'm what, sorry, I'm sorry. Head in, head in your hands from tears from laughing or from- Complete- what? utter defeat okay babylon 5 broke me in the first couple of minutes and not in the way that like a confessions and lamentations did but in a way of just like oh my god this where i'm i'm going to we, we had that one i forget i forget the episode but where the computer had that ridiculous ai that you thought was hilarious <laughs> yeah the new york accent yeah and i'm just like this is an affront this is horrible oh my god <laughs> They're going to keep like Garibaldi shot it right in the, in the, and I'm like, yes. And that's, I mean, I, I enjoy Penn and Teller. I enjoy their work. I think, you know, whatever they're funny, they're talented. They're all those great things. They're in Babylon. Oh my. Hello, uh, Greg Brady surfing, uh, in Hawaii, right? Like this, where's the shark? Cause you're Fawn's about jumping the shark literally. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. But then yeah. we got, I got a glimmer of hope, glimmer of hope. Because we got a deep dive into the Hayak, right? Like, like you said, uh, back in the second season, we got a deep dive into the Drazi. Ooh, we're gonna learn about the Burkiri. Like, I, I like this using this time to learn about the other races. I was so ready to hate this episode, and then it turned. Mm. This Day of the Dead is a Star Trek episode. Yeah, that happened to be done on Babylon Five. Total Next Generation. Maybe even a uh, second season of Picard here a little bit, right? Some mysterious thing causes the crew to be mysteriously transported across the galaxy to come face to face with their pasts. <laughs> but this wasn't just their pasts. Here's the Babylon 5 piece, right? It's a bunch of dead people. And some of those dead people had beef with them, right? We got to look at Lockley, Lanier and Morden for some reason. Dodger and Adira. Oh my God. I, I, I enjoyed that, this little foray into, into the, the characters and some story. I, I thought that was cool. I am really eager to hear what white star thoughts you have on this one. <laughs> I want to know what your Rebo and Zudi thoughts are. And yeah, just tell me what, 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 what about you? Where, where were you on this one? Uh, I feel like you've built this up in your head and I'm about to disappoint you in so many ways. Uh, Jeff, I think the season, uh, this episode is the season's geometry of shadows. I, I know right where you're at. You know where I am? Yep. Uh, on the surface, this looks like a waste of an episode. Was it a comedy? Was it a horror? It had the potential to be either one and it did neither. Some cool stuff happened, but does it ultimately matter? No, not really. However, there was that one thing that that one guy said that probably is going to come back later and be pretty big. So actually, it is more important than you might think. Hello, can you say foreshadowing? Just thoughts. I remember hearing people talk about our reaction to Geometry of Shadows. <laughs> foreshadowing. I'm like, yeah, we don't know that it's foreshadowing yet, guys. Anyway, uh, I thought Penn and Teller were a complete waste. They were absolutely wasted on this episode. My problems with this episode overall functionally is there were so many different places, Jeff, 
that they they started getting down a line with something and then they just stopped. For example, as soon as Rebo and Zudi started talking about wanting to quit comedy and do something more exciting, I was like, yeah, okay, let's let's have that conversation about about why being in entertainment is actually an important job and in realizing that what you're doing actually matters because there's no way they need to do that and go be in politics. They just don't, but they did nothing with it. Like they had that conversation, Dylan and Sheridan, like kind of looked at each other. They said like a sentence that didn't really make much of a difference. And then they got off. The next thing we saw, they were walking off the station and, and tell her stop to talk to Sheridan for a second and give him some cryptic message that makes no sense whatsoever. I thought with the ghost, there might be some sort of definitive ghost story. Jakar says at the end, you all seem more at peace. So are these people dealing with, with unresolved stuff in their life? What, what the hell is Lanier looking at Morden for? Right? Okay. Maybe, maybe what these guys are, these are people who have, who are coming back, who have messages from beyond. We saw that with Zoe. We saw that with Morden and you really, it really has nothing to do with the person like like the the whoever's in the great beyond is sending these people during the, the the day of death, but then what the hell is Dodger doing there? Like he she didn't further Garibaldi at all. She didn't provide closure for him at all. Loved seeing Londo get with Ladira. I loved that. What impact did that have on anything whatsoever? Did it make Londo ready to be emperor? Did it resolve some conflict that he's had long standing? No. He got to bonk his girl one more time. And she's like, hey, it's pretty cool. You're going to be over 40 billion people. And they did nothing. Like, that one was like a 50. Like, they just didn't do much with it. You know, it, it, this, this was a lot of really cool concept that they could have gone somewhere that, to me, failed in execution. It just, it was a lot of false starts. And that was, that was my overall impression of this episode. I, I don't think that, uh, and you said it, that Londo and Adira went one time. I think they went six times. It's gonna, that's where I'm going to, I'm going to sit on. Yeah, that. I got to, I got to admit, there is a piece of me, like I'm looking at Adira. She's got, she's got like her shoulders are bare mm -hmm. and she, you know, she, she's definitely got some sort of clothing on and she's got the head thing going on. And I'm sitting here just trying to go, where are the six places Yeah, on her body that connections get made? Like, boop. Where are those six places? I'm just curious. Where's that video? Also, please don't share it. <laughs> oh, please don't. Don't produce it and no. don't share it if it exists out there. I do not need to see that. <laughs> I think I think though Adira played a really important role in this one. I think that's so I, I still have um I'm not sure the the, the Dodger one, I, I I haven't really figured out what she was there for other than like a, a cool callback, you know, like, oh, that was fun. Jeff, I'm sorry. Can I stop you real quick? Because I want yeah. to talk to everybody out there just for a second. Please do not fire off a bunch of things doing a deep dive explaining all of this to us just yet, especially if this is making connections back to previous episodes or stuff that's coming forward. Let Jeff and I get that on the second watch. And once we get to the second watch, we get back here. Have at it. But for right now. Let us try to figure this out. Like we're, we're trying to figure out what the hell these guys were all doing here. Let us be in this space right now. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, Cause to your point, geometry of shadows taught us the level of foreshadowing that happens in this show. So like now we're going to have that lens to look at this, you know? Right, and right. so, but I think when with Adira, like there's a surface level thing where it just felt good. You know, it's like, yeah, Londo gets something nice to happen to him. And, mm -hmm. and this is, this is good. But I actually thought thought about it in terms of the Catholic Mass. So in the in the Catholic Mass on Sundays and other high feast days, there are four readings from the Bible, actual scripture that we read, and then the the priest can use that for his homily to to build off of. There's a generally a reading from the Old Testament uh, during the period after Easter and the octave of Easter. That's from the Acts of the Apostles, but. Generally, it's the Old Testament. Then there's um, a psalm that uh, that is generally sung. Then there's a second reading, usually from the epistles, right? So St. Paul's letters, maybe St. John's letters. Then there's the gospel reading itself. Now, the psalm 
and the psalm will generally tie to the gospel in a real, you know, kind of loose way. Um, the second reading from the letters, that's that's just there. Sometimes it lines up, sometimes it doesn't. But the first reading is specifically built to do what we say as Catholics, to give us Jewish ears. So that when we hear the gospel recited, we can hear it as the Jews from the time of Jesus would have heard this. You know, so they're going to talk about this thing in the gospel and you're like, oh, that's because of this thing they talked about in Job or the when Moses said, you know, so you kind of prep us. There's a tie in the first reading to prepare you for the gospel reading. And I think that this moment with Adira was our first reading. This was to prepare us for what's about to go down with Londo. We needed to remember not Londo, the genocidal genocide in person, right, not right. Londo, the guy who had Rifa taken out by a bunch of Narns. We had to remember the Londo who forgot how to dance. Right. We had to remember Londo who saw himself as a burnt out old Republican, you know? And so I think, I think that this is not just foreshadowing. It's like Adira is not going to play a role, but it had to put our minds back in a place with Londo. Mm. I thought I did really well. So you think that that was Adira coming to visit Londo was less about the benefit of Londo and more for the benefit of us as a viewer. Yes. Yes. Interesting. I think you're a thousand percent right about that. Uh, or even that Londo needed to be reminded he doesn't care about the, yeah, you know, like he said for a while, like he doesn't really want to be emperor. Like he doesn't, he just wants to serve his people. What, what was the thing he said to her? Like the one boast he made to her. I'm the savior I'm of the our savior people. savior of our people, he says. Um, which is a bit rich, but he's probably also not wrong. Like, yeah. He, he, yeah, he is the the destroyer of Narn, the savior of the Centauri, and the savior of Narn. Yeah. Like, in many Yeah, ways. maybe our people, right, goes beyond that. But you yeah. take that, I'm the savior of our people, to use your word, juxtaposed mm -hmm. with, I would give those 40 billion people up for you. For you. I, I love that as a message. I still don't see, like if she would have come back with a message for Londo of like, remember how to dance. Oh, like yeah. let that be his message. Like remember how to dance. Like, like yeah, yeah, Londo, do that. Let's make that happen. Like that'd be cool, you know? Yeah. Uh, she didn't, and I I could definitely see definitely see your whole piece uh, about that. I I gotta tell you though, um, I just thought it was so good to see her again. And I, I I mean I I think we'd written her off so long ago, and and to this isn't a clip from when she was on the sh the episode before. This was her like on set filming new material. Like so good, so good. 40 billion is a lot of people, Jeff. That's a lot of people. That's a, I mean, we got eight, nine on Earth today. Yeah, and we're losing it. Like, we're freaking out. Like, what do we do? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a lot of people. 40 billion folks. Uh, Garibaldi. Let's talk about him for a sec. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Well, I have to tell you, I was offended. There was one line in this whole thing that yeah. personally offended me. And I'm just okay. like, I don't. I don't know what in the world, how could you put this ink on paper, let it dry, and then let someone speak this on television? <laughs> Capers on pizza? <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, you know sushi, that stuff you eat with bubble gum. Is she, what's wrong with her? Capers go on sandwiches. Capers go in the trash. <laughs> no, here's, here's a great way. To, you, there's a great caper no, recipe. No, I'm sorry. no, you know where capers go? In the cabinet because you never use them for anything. That's where capers go. Everyone has them just in the cabinet. Bought it one time because a recipe said capers. They've been there since 1989. <laughs> there's a great thing you can do with capers. It's kind of a, it's, it's, it's similar to what you can do with kale. And it works really well. But what you do is you get a surface, a plate, a platter, something like that. And you coat it with uh, coconut oil. And then you lay the capers on top of it. 
and that coconut oil becomes important or the kale because that coconut oil makes it easier for it to slide off the platter into the garbage. There you go. I was going to say, it's, it's interesting you said kale because that's where they both belong. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. But then, but then the second thing she said that I actually was just like, <gasps> she said technomancy. And if there's technomancy, that means that the techno mages might do a thing. And I just got excited that there was a tie. And I love now that I'm saying this, that you tied this to geometry of shadows and there's a real subtle call back to techno mages. All right. That's Garibaldi. Yeah. I mean, okay. Garibaldi's married. We're, we've established that, right? Like so, he seems to have forgotten about it. I think so. I thought so. I thought he was. Um, Garibaldi's married. This girl shows up. That is okay. I, I mean, let's ask, would it, if he would have slept with her, would, was that cheating? This is not a real person. This is a ghost that does not really exist. All right. I'm not even going to get into that. Well, she's going to be gone by morning. So who would ever know? Like I, Garibaldi would know, and that's going to be on his conscience, but like, did she like her and Adira, like, were they physically, I, I mean, I, I had to be physically there if stuff could have happened. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, but if yes or no, I'm going to pin you down. Yes or no. If Garibaldi would have slept with Dodger, was he cheating on his wife? Yes. Okay. They're sitting there. I feel like they kissed once or twice. Her head is on his lap, really close to his junk. Maybe on his junk. Yeah. He kind of even uh, went, Whoa, there's a lot of caressing. There's a lot of laughing and flirting. Yes or no. Was Garibaldi cheating on his wife? Yes. I heard someone say once that cheating doesn't start when I'm going to, uh, when it happens, <laughs> yeah. it capital, capital, it Welcome cheating, to our PG RPG show here. Yeah. Cheating happens the minute you respond to the direct message or the text message. Mm. Mm. Cheating. Be- and I've come to believe this. Yeah. I've come to accept this, that cheating begins in the mind. I 100% am with you on that. 100% with you on that. Um, so here's then the question. Let me ask this. These ghosts, were they real or were they projections? Yeah. I Were they in the mind of these people? I think that, that's a, God, it's a tough question. I can't, because on one hand, yeah. On the other hand, like they brought new material to them. You know what I mean? Like I'm trying to think of the show. It's something that my daughter watched, some animated show. And uh, this person's having a real cri- crisis, and oh, it was it was the Simpsons, a Simpsons episode where Bleeding Gums Murphy uh-huh. dies, yeah. and is talking to Lisa, and Lisa's yeah. like meets his son, right, who uh, has a hearing impairment, and there's all this stuff. She takes up his cause, and then like she has a dream, and the vision of Bleeding Gums Murphy is talking to her, and she's like, "Oh, you really think that?" And he says, hey, this is your dream. I'm going to think what and say whatever you want me to think and say. I don't think these people said what they would have wanted them to think and say. I think they were real. Mm. Well, of course I'm in your mind, but why should that make it any less real? It's another way to say that. Yeah. I mean, th- I think the truth is we don't know. Like, what was this weird bubble that everybody was in that Sheridan threw something at and it went way too slow to come back at him with that much force? That was, re- like, that was, I, I hated that scene, but I loved that scene. Like, yeah. I watched it over and over. Like, on my rewatch for notes, yeah. I'm like, I just want to watch that again. Hey, do you know why Sheridan was in this episode? Because uh, he's in the opening credits. Well, because he was contractually already paid for it. They'd already paid him for it. That's it um get had, dressed go throw this fire extinguisher that's smaller than a can of soda right him him and delenn had zero actual purpose in this episode um i guess while we're here let's talk about people with zero purpose in this episode Penn and teller yeah now what was your reaction when you saw Penn and teller come out the second they walked out i was just like oh so tnt is forcing guest stars on them now yes that's a thousand per- i mean this is what cw was doing when they tried to get Enterprise to put a boy band in the in the mess hall of Enterprise. Yes. <laughs> Popular band. They did it with Charmed. They did it on what what was it? Dawson's Creek, I feel like they've done it. They did it on so many of those shows. TNT definitely this has every bit of that feel that they they tried to force that on. Yeah, my, uh, Rebo my, and Zuki were not funny. No. I was say here's my exact note. They were awful. 
I can't believe I'm watching this. I am Lockley rolling my eyes and I'm looking for a reason to leave too. I really kind of wish, like, I hope that Penn and Teller were forced on them by the studio. JMS wrote them to be stupid and Lockley served as JMS, i.e. our proxy on yeah. screen. It's the closest he could get to keffering them without keffering them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although I got to say, when I first saw them, I was very excited because I love Penn and Teller. Yeah, they are great. If something you don't know about me, I told, I told the folks on Brent watches this. When I was growing up, my best friend lived two doors down from me. His name was David. We, he was a year or so younger than I was. Uh, best friend growing up, you know, over each other's houses all the time. Uh, David, genius of a kid. Like I went, this kid, when he was nine years old, so this is 89, 90, when the internet is still like military bound, created a website selling brass knuckles. What? Yes. A nine-year-old created a website selling brass knuckles to this day, to this day, it is the number one retailer of brass knuckles in the world. What? He, this man does almost nothing with it. As far as I understand, he just sits back and paper money in the mail huh. number one retail like it's all automated like this man did amazon before jeff bezos did amazon he just nailed it down to brass knuckles like wow. my friend david also got into magic and he he was the magician the magic now i've always had a bit of a flair for the showman love david he didn't we teamed up as kids because we were best friends and we had a pen and teller act that we would do at birthday parties and, and different things like that. We had it all set out and it was the same basic idea. I did the speaking, David did not. And it was, so there was a lot of studying of pen and teller and how they worked. And they were very big influences on a very young me. Wow. Loved watching them, loved watching them. I was so ready for this to be a comedy. It was not a comedy. No. Oh, when they're sitting there having their conversation, and I mentioned it earlier about they want to give up comedy to go do something important. I'm going to save the rest of that conversation, but I, I, I was so disappointed that that just fell so flat. Well, I, th I thought there of is you a finish to that episode. There is a finish to that conversation. That yeah, I thought of you in that, in that line. Cause I'm just like, this is a Brent is, is a working for like traveling, touring comedian. He knows this and good comedy has a real message. It's, it's the most, uh, it can be one of the most subversive ways to get really difficult conversations and concepts across to people in ways that are relatable and that you can hear and understand. And I was it, just like, this is, this is Brent's jam. And they're not even when, gonna when, when Rebo said we can say something really cool, but then it gets lost in the comedy. I disagreed so vehemently. It's like, it doesn't get lost in the comedy. It lands because of the comedy. Yeah. It gets through it, it. It does for the message. What placing stuff in sci-fi does. This is why we do this show. This is why, this is why sci-fi is uniquely positioned as a genre to hold up a mirror to society and show us who we are. It's because you can, you can do it in the form of alien. So it's not offensive and it could show us right here, right? Like sci-fi is uniquely positioned to give us these messages and these tales and these uh, to give us hope for a future in a way that crime procedurals and, uh, uh, sitcoms and dramas and legal things and hospital shows. Those aren't, those are not positioned to be able to do in a way that sci-fi is comedy is that same way for being able to comment and, and, and criticize and bolster and shape the attitudes of society. Comedy has a way of doing that because it comes in, in the form of comedy and people are more ready to accept it. Yep. Yeah. I, he was so wrong in that. And that's all going to play into my, my white star thoughts. Cool. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> I'm excited to hear about it, but yeah, I, I mean, I have nothing on else on Rebo and Zudi other than, Hey, that's cool. They studied other cultures, humor. And that little cryptic line at the end was literally just like, Hey, let's feed something to them to say it, to close off a storyline that meant nothing to show teller actually said, he, he said one word to his partner, but he's going to say four to Sheridan. Yeah. Because it told me so or whatever he said. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, well, just to kind of pivot away from that and other stuff, did you, they had a newspaper, right? Cause Corwin was like trying to do some stuff and there was this newspaper that was there. Did you catch any of the headlines on the newspaper? I, I didn't, I just saw the one, the pen and teller, their actual photo, not pen with this weird wig going on. Um, I, I saw their picture and I just thought it was, uh, pushing back to them all the time. No, what, what did they say? Yeah. So I actually paused, uh, the thing when they showed the front and the back and everything to get the pieces. So there was a meet Rebo and Zudi up close and personal Babylon five will air a Rebo and Zudi movie marathon that Lockley got caught into. Uh, then there's a Rebo and Zudi arrive. Then there was a couple here that were kind of interesting. Interstellar Alliance talks to resume. Hmm. I wonder what that's about. Londo Malari to become. I'm sorry, wait, what is resume? Do we know? Exactly. I don't, I never knew they stopped. So. Okay. That's uh maybe there's oh, something. Wait, 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 Read that again. Interstell Interstellar. Interstellar Alliance talks to resume. I thought you meant resume was like a news magazine or something and that they were talking to them. Like, is it, you're talking about the talks to resume. Okay. Interesting. And maybe yeah. now that I, I just said that we're talking about, maybe that's one of those plot points and where things land that this did matter, uh, but, yeah. but also it doesn't matter. Because wasn't it, wasn't it in, um, oh, what were those episodes? Learning Curve and View from the Gallery that people were like stonewalling the Alliance really? or something like that. Yeah. So. It, wasn't it, wasn't it like it was, it, cause remember the Drazi were like, oh, we're, we don't have to, we don't have to sign a pledge of anything because we're amazing. And yet we're actually jacking these people up over here yeah yeah it might, might have been around to that yeah, yeah, yeah. in the hiccups there but yeah there was a little one alondo malari to become centauri emperor and i think this one was important because I it was that a, one, by the way. yeah it was teeny tiny and it was below the fold and londo saw that right and he yeah. was just like yeah you're not even above the fold news dude like it doesn't dude that is not anything i would have picked up until like my second third fourth viewing yeah this was my second that i i mean i saw this stuff and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. but I went back on my second one. Reclamation of San Diego Wasteland gets underway. Okay. Maybe this is where Bureau 13 pops up again. I think that's a wasted storyline that's never coming back. I agree. I can hope. Stocks. Yeah. How to how how your credit rates. Um then there were the two that I think that might turn into things. One was the Earth Senate votes for more money on Titan reforming or terra on Titan terraforming. Titan being a moon of Neptune? I think so. I think it's Neptune. I think it's Neptune. Yeah. And then the other one, a Narn consulate opens on Mars amid controversy. There's a controversy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So those are, you know, Jeff, here's the thing. I would totally write those off, except in our very first episode. You get to the end and you're like, hey, did you hear what that newscaster said as the episode was fading to black about President Clark and all this? And I'm like, yeah. And you're like, that's going to be like a central thing of the whole deal. And they put it right here. And I'm like, yeah. And yeah, that's literally what ignited the whole thing. Right. So, Two whole seasons of yeah. that, that yeah, as it was fading out. Yeah. Where you want to go next? You want to talk uh, Morden and Lanier? I was gonna say, what do we have left? We have Morden and Lanier, and then Lockley and and Zoe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk Morden and Lanier because that one should go quick. Um. All right. First of all, Lanier, dude. Literally, here's my note. Right as I gave up on seeing him again, he waltzes right back into my life. Here he comes. Here comes Zaba Gabi, just right out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And then, man, he he's all oh, the Lynn. So good to see you. And he goes, how is your partner, your partner? And Dylan goes, my husband is fine. And I'm sitting here going, dude, you know, Sheridan personally. She does not have to say my husband. She could say, John, you know him. You do not know. Come on yeah. now. So petty. Oh, oh, honestly, if you're that petty, you shouldn't be on the shock. Um, anyway, those, those were my two initial notes on Lanier. What did you think, Jeff? I'm curious when Lanier popped on the station, he popped up on screen. What, what was your reaction? Eh. Yeah. So underwhelming, right? Yeah. 
Like I, it should have been a big moment and it wasn't. Nope. I, 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 I feel like he had to be here because there was some, there was some foreshadowing that, that occurred. But other than that, I think it's a huge waste of yeah, how he could have showed up. Shadows part. Hey, that one line happened with that one guy over there. Yep. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. And that one line, you're going to betray the analyst shock. Oh, I would die before I did that. And he's like, yeah. okay. And then like they, they had that line and he goes, I would do this. And then literally all that happened was Morden sat in a chair and read a newspaper until it was time for him to disappear. Yep. This, that was it. Like what? And then, and then he got a little jab in, right? He's like, you know, well, uh, Delenn doesn't love you the way that you love her. Yeah. But I thought it was neat because he's like, I already know that. And he's like, actually, you don't. In your heart, you don't know that. That might be a catalyst for how he's going to wind up betraying the endless shock. That's what I think, too. Yeah. Go yeah. after Intilza. I, I think he when he betrays the endless shock, because I think that's coming. Like, I 100%. I'm like... Yep, that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to intend to do it, though. Okay. He's going to do it, but I don't think he's going to intend to do it. You know, I don't think he, I don't, th in his mind, it's not going to be betraying them, but it will be. He's going to think he's doing the right thing. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's what I think. That's what I think. And maybe he really will be doing the right thing, but, you know, like, you know, well, I'm not going to go there. Anyway. All right. Then we got Zoe. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Um, when when Rebo and Zudi met Dylan and Sheridan, mm -hmm. and Zudi plays the little machine and it ha tells this joke in Mimbari that none of us actually understood in Dylan's, I 1000% really appreciated how slow Dylan took to laugh. Like she heard it. It was, you could see like the acting on that was amazing yeah. because it, 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 it had to go through her brain. You could see it running through her brain a couple of times and she's like, uh, oh, that is a joke. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. Like it was, it was so well acted and well played as opposed to as juxtaposed Jeff, everybody else laughing to Rebo and Zudi, which was fake and awful and horrible. We've already covered that. We yes. That. Terrible. Um, Oh, well, before, I'm sorry. Jakar walking into CNC with his robe and in, in his PJs, but it wasn't the the bathrobe with the chest piece. Right. Mm. That just goes to show where Jakar's come. Like, think about it. He used to be that dude, you know, with three girls walking out of the room, most of them Centauri, if I remember right. And then this one, you know, here he is in a full like monk's robe coming out. But also, like, Babylon 5 is huge. Huge. Yeah. And you're going to go ask to sleep in CNC. CNC, right? There's not a hotel on Babylon 5 you can't go for a night. Can, can I go sleep in Lockley's office? Can Can I go to Talon's room? Any of the fellow Narns on the station? One, one square mile out of this massive thing is gone and you go to... Mm, okay. Yeah. I, and maybe that's like one fifth of the station, right? Like that's a huge part. It's a big chunk, but, but like still. there's a lot of the station left. Yeah. And talking about uh, acting, like, you know, Mira Furlan's acting, I agree. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. I thought Tracy Scoggins did a great job in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because she had this yeah. balance of like, I have this, what I'll call core trauma in her life that she's face to face mm -hmm. with. But at the same time, she's like, I'm captain of the station. There's weird stuff going on. I have to try to work to help solve this problem. And she just did a great job in being present in that moment, in those moments with Zoe, but also really yeah. impressed with her. Yeah, she, she did. She did the thing she needed to do. I also appreciated the look. I'm pretty sure if we just let this go till morning, it'll be fine. Although her just popping in on Garibaldi unannounced <laughs> should not, I mean, like that needs to be a ring and you have to say here, like I, I you lose the comedic awkward zooming in, you know, it's you totally space balls when uh, Lord Helmet's using the bathroom, right? Oh, President Scrooge! Oh. <laughs> or or uh, uh, when he's actually, President Scrooge was in bed with the, the two girls. Yeah. He comes up and he's got the book upside down or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then she does it again to uh, uh, the other person. Talando, yeah. 
Yeah, to Londo. That's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, Zo- Zoe and and uh, Lockley. I got to tell you, when Zoe first appeared, everything about that whole interaction said to me, "Little sister." Totally. Did not say, I, I, or is a former girlfriend is was I think the ultimate thing they were going for that never clicked for me i went from kid sister to like best friend like we were best, best friends friend. who ran Just, off doing drugs maybe i'm doing that thing where i see two people and i want to i want to put them together in a relationship that they don't actually have because they really never were clear about it although mm-hmm. it did there were some romantic overtones it seemed to me at times but never never anything explicit they did do a lot of partying yeah uh and by that bad stuff yeah i think that a lot of like, par- you got any stuff you want to She's like, I've been dead for 20 years. Can I do something while right. I'm here? Do you got any new cool stuff? Like, what have right. they done to this? But I think, like, I definitely got um, trauma bond, right? And so, mm-hmm. like, we're, we're going to go party. We're going to run off. We're going to live wherever we can live, sleep wherever we can sleep, as long as we're getting, you know, our next fix is around the corner. Right. And so I, 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 I never got romance, but, like, we've talked about that. Romance isn't my mother tongue. And, uh, you know, so maybe that's why I didn't pick up on it. But to me, it just really, it really hit like trauma bond. And like I said, it's a core memory, a core trauma. I mean, her passcode is Zoe's dead. That was a little over the top for me, honestly. Very on the nose. Now, I got to be honest. My, I think I've said this on the show before. My Wi-Fi password is the name of my dead dog. Two dogs ago. Like, you know, like I, I get it, but I'm not, my pass, it's not, it's not Sam is dead. It's just Sam. Yeah. Like the passcode would just be Zoe, not Zoe's dead. Like, no, uh, to me, I, I'm not speaking to anyone else's trauma or what that looks like. Cause this clearly is something that has influenced her all the way up. But th- think about where she's gone. So she was a drug riddled teenager, maybe young twenties mm-hmm. gets rescued by her Marine uncle or whatever she dad, said he was. her dad. Didn't you say it was a, she? He sent like the uncle or something like that. No, it was dad, right? Yeah, right, right. with with his with buddies from his platoon. Yeah, so she grew up as a military brat, but out of that situation, she goes off to join the forces mm-hmm. and works. She she's clean and gets her life together and works her way up to being the captain of a station. Like that's a pretty good bump. That's a pretty good jump. But she still has all this old stuff. She found her friend dead. And never knew why. And the and core thing, have. and the core thing, and I want to, I want to acknowledge right now. We're going to talk about self harm. We're going to talk about suicide yeah. for a minute. So skip ahead if this is activating for you in any way. Pausing. Okay. She didn't know. Did you do this on purpose? Yeah. Right. And it was a, it was a big thing, and and it was powerful when she kind of when Zoe explained a little bit like. At first it wasn't, but then it was on purpose. Yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't go on anymore, yeah. which I thought was real interesting because you have Zoe who we first met her and she's like, Hey, you got any more stuff? Like, let's part. Let's, let's do some, let's do some fun. Let's go. Here. Actually, I couldn't go on anymore. Yeah. That's what happened. Like that is, that is such a, a, a change in where you are. I think it's very. pictorial of an addict okay when you when you get into a sober spot as an addict and you go i can't do this anymore but then when you're in your old triggers you're like yeah let's let's just go do this because what does it do it numbs the pain it numb takes you out of all this stuff you just want it you enjoy it and Mm -hmm. all of that stuff and yeah she she was here for something that's that's a first response i i thought that was real interesting but you're right the way that that tracy scoggins portrayed this whole deal Again, this led us down a road that it never delivered on, though. Because here you have a character who has unresolved stuff in their life. Oh, wait. Londo has unresolved stuff in his life. Oh, Garibaldi has unresolved stuff with Dodger? Eh, But he's married now. Lanier has unresolved stuff with Morton. No, okay. That it, it all falls apart at that point. Yeah. And even like you know? it starts to at Garibaldi, but I think if we think about it, it might be <laughs> I I never questioned him and Lise, but maybe this was a thing of just like, hey, by the way, look, 
good dude. He's going to, you know, in his mind, stay faith. I, I don't know. Uh, does he have, uh, yeah, it, it's Garib, it's Garibaldi and Lanier that the whole thing kind of falls apart around. It really does. It really does. Um, and that's, and that's just where I go back to now. I have one major. Qu okay. So she comes in, she has this message for Sheridan. Let's talk about this message real quick. Yeah. When the long night comes, go back to the end of the beginning. Let's start at the end. What is the end of the beginning? I thought about that a lot. And the best I can come up with is the end, the beginning. I got to start there. What's the beginning? And I would think the beginning is Lorien and the ancient ones and the first ones. Mm. So what's the end of that? The end of that was when they mission accomplished and went out beyond the rim. So my thought is, well, let's pause there. What, 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 where's your beginning and end? I think the beginning to me was Sheridan's life. And the end is when he lost his life, which we got confirmed in this episode that he died at Zaha Doom to go back to the end of the beginning because stuff didn't really start happening for Sheridan until the Lorian stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, everything before that would be beginning. So the end of the beginning, go back to that space. He's got to go back to Zaha Doom. Okay. Now Zaha Doom's blown up right now, but he's got to go back to Zaha Doom. That was, that's my thought. Right now, people are like, oh, you're so wrong. Yeah, I probably am. Yeah, we, probably, yeah. we have no idea. There's Because yeah, my, my guess is it's telling him to go beyond the rim. So the oh, ancient and first okay. ones went beyond the rim. And so he says, when the long night comes, and the episode yeah. The Long Night taught us that that's the end of a peak conflict. And so we'll have some peak conflict come up. Uh, and when that's done, Sheridan needs to go. It's time for Sheridan and his people to go beyond the rim. Wow. Sheridan and his people specifically or Sheridan and his people as in humans? I I think humans. I wow. think. So what he's saying is, is, hey, when it comes time for humans to leave this galaxy. Come with us. Wow. That's. But Sheridan's only got like less than 20 years left, man. Like. Sort of. You know, I mean, I mean, yes, but also we know that that's not necessary. I mean, he died. That's not necessarily the end, right? And we know that in a thousand years, was it a thousand years that, or, or however, I forget, I forget the breakdown that we got in the deconstruction of falling stars, but they're going to start telling the story of Babylon 5 and Sheridan as a holy book. Maybe it's up to him to leave that message that, you know, here's, here's I think it got go. up to a thousand years. I think it was a thousand. Yeah. A thousand. It, and then it, it jumped it to a year. Million. It was like a year and then it was like a hundred years and then it was like 500 years and then it was a thousand with the, or, and then maybe it was like a hundred thousand or a million. Well, it was a million. It was a million Dude, when, man. yeah. When, when the start, when the sun blew up and all that stuff went down. Oh, cause they all went beyond the rim. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe they went beyond the rim. I don't know, maybe. but, hmm. or maybe that's it. The beginning was midnight on the firing line and the end was deconstruction of falling stars and we're just in the prologue now so when the long night of the prologue happens go back to the end of the beginning which is uh wherever dude went in his analog shock ship when the sun blew up i confused myself saying all that <laughs> basically i think that just means it's time to watch babylon 5 again yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh okay so here's the bigger question Morden comes with a message. You're going to betray the endless shock. I don't really know that that's a message as much as I'm going to rub your face in it, but it mm -hmm. feels like a message. Zoe comes with a message. Dodger, we could, we could maybe pull a message out of our butts about that one, but I don't think there really existed one, which is why this breaks down. Londo, again, you could kind of pull a message out of that, but I think it kind of breaks down. Here's the question. Why does each person get the person that they get? Because it's clearly doesn't have to do with unresolved conflict that you're having to, to resolve as Jakar suggested at the end when he's like, you all seem more peaceful. Like, no, they don't. The bigger question, 
who is sending these people? If it's not a creation of their own soul and they're coming with a message, who is sending them? I think, and this might be a controversial opinion, but I think no one has any idea. I think the whole thing was contrived and made up with no explanation whatsoever for the sole purpose of getting a handful of messages out. And then they didn't have enough content to fill a full 43 minute episode. So they tossed in a couple more. I think that's it, Jeff. I think the God's honest truth is Lanier is going to betray the endless shock and Sheridan gets this cryptic message from Kosh from beyond the grave. And then like, we get some Lockley development. We learn a little bit about Lockley. A little bit of that. And that is the that is the full extent of the purpose of this episode, which may be fine, but still, like... I, and God, I, do you I, know I, what I would have loved this in this? Like shadows all over again. Like, do you know what I would have loved? What's that? If Ivanova was still on the station and Talia came back. No, I disagree. Really? Because if Talia would have come back... Well, uh, if Talia would have come back and she was evil Talia. That's the only way I would accept it. If Talia came back and she was bland, vanilla Talia before, no. No. You know who should have come back instead? It'd be her mom or her dad. Ooh, that's good too. You know, probably her mom, frankly, because yeah. the whole tell because you talk, you know, you know, a theme that they really just sort of dropped and never did much with? Ivanova's a latent telepath. Well, no, if you remember in that pivotal moment at the end of the Shadow War when the telepaths swooped in. And Ivanova was at the front with Bester because they were strong telepaths and they're the whole, Oh wait, no, never, yeah. never mind. I mean, it is what, it is what allowed her to plug into the great machine. And then she realized that the shadows knew her name in that one episode, but like, and got that I piece mean, it, of the, the, the president Clark stuff that whatever. Yeah. It just, it just like, what, like it's a neat thing, but what is it? What did it matter? Like, anyway, I just think in terms of, Oh my God. What was the episode after? People Severance? are so pissed at me right now, Jeff. I'm sorry. They're so pissed at me right now. I like, you know, you know, guys, listen, Babylon fire for the second time is coming up soon. I just think back to, I think it was ceremonies of light and dark when, um, is that the one that was after severed dreams? Yeah. I don't remember. Oh yeah. That's, that's the one where Dylan wound up in the hospital and like, she gave them all the new uniforms, right? Yeah, but they all went in and shared something yeah, secret, yeah, yeah. the rebirth ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. And Ivanova's was, I think I might have been in love with Talia. Oh, yeah. Right, right. And right. nothing ever came from that ever. This would have been an awesome place to go back and visit that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of other cool ones that we could have grabbed. Actually, having Ivanova, having Ivanova be the one to come back and tell somebody something. Have Ivanova come, come back dead. to care of Ivanova's not dead. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, why, that's why Talia would need to come back. Yeah, because I was like, have Ivanova come back to Garibaldi. That would be, but she's not dead, so yeah, she could actually come back as a star. I'm trying to think: is are there anybody or any other big losses we had that would have been cool? Have have Naroon come to Delenn mm. or Ducat? Ducat. Oh yes, yeah. They could have done some cool stuff with this. Could have but... done some cool stuff. Have I mean, get Michael O'Hare back and let him do a thing. Cause he's dead by now. Then dead for a thousand years. Right. You know? Yeah. <sighs> well, you Brett, know what I want? You know what I really want? What's that? And I'm sure they're never going to come back to this. I want to go find wherever he went after he was doing his thing as Valen. Like after you know, that, that was the whole story was like, he had a bajillion kids and then he wound up living in like exile on some Island somewhere. Like I want to go find that Island that he was on. Like I would love the story of Valen period right let's yeah. let's see that story and then have that like valen the after years <laughs> right it'd be, it'd be cool right i think that we have reached the point of this conversation where we boil this all down mm. check and see if this episode has any deep morals messages to it or if it's holding up a mirror to society or maybe possibly even giving us hope that we might be better in the future but at the same time we're looking at how much it delivers that message in its own unique Babylon 5 way. Brent, you get to do that by rating this episode on a scale of zero to five white stars. What do you got? I might be mean on this one, Jeff. Okay.
I'm going to I'm going to start by telling you my white star rating and then I want to explain it. Okay. And I may I'm I'm saying this now because I may uh I'm sorry YouTube. Hold on just a sec. My cable for my headphones is really freaking long and sometimes my chair like rolls over the cable and then gets caught and I'm like hey. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Say this, start that over again. I'm actually going to tell you my rating first, and then I'm going to explain it. But I'm going to reserve a caveat that I may change my rating as I talk myself into something. Okay. And Jeff, I'm going to allow you some input on this. If you want, if you if you want to stump for something, here's my initial rating. No white stars. Wow. Okay. And here's why. Because what do we say? Does this does this show have a message, and how does it deliver it in a Babylon Five way? This episode doesn't really have much of a message. It started having some messages. It never finished them. It never deliver. It didn't deliver the message. Let me give you the message that this episode really should have tackled, that it wanted to tackle. Again, I go back to Rebo and Zudi sitting there saying, "Hey, we think we want to." give up comedy because we want to do something that's important. Hey, this is, this is something that actually I could kind of relate to Londo and Lady Adira and what they got going on. Hmm. I could also relate this to, uh, I don't know, um, Lanier who has given up something to do something that he felt was important. Uh, I could also relate this to, um, I don't know, Lockley who gave up something to do something important. But for Rebo and Zudi specifically, they say they want to do something important. And Sheridan so gets so close to saying, yeah, but we need you. Your comedy is important. Comedy is, like, that is an important job. Jeff, I, folks out there know I've, I've been a stay-at-home dad for a number of years. And as often as I talk about, like, you know, it's, it's hard because you just feel like, man, I'm just wasting my life. Oh, but do you know how important it is to be raising good kids? Like, that's a really important job to, to, to raise the next generation. Like, like you get that sort of platitude that they're not wrong. It doesn't feel good, but they're not wrong. This might be a little bit like that. Here's the deal. Entertainment is important. Comedy is important. Being an entertainer is important you mentioned earlier i used to do stand-up comedy that is absolutely true i stopped that's actually when i started getting into podcasting because i had i needed I, I had a creative thing that i needed an outlet for and i wasn't able to go out every night and be on tour and even not even having a residency working night like that i just didn't have that ability anymore i still don't at this point during COVID, though, this became crystal clear to me, though, Jeff, during COVID. I don't know about you. You started during COVID, right? During COVID, as a podcaster, as a YouTuber, I was with a different podcast. I was like two podcasts ago for me, and it was wildly popular. It was, it was, there was some important pieces that happened. It was the NFL podcast, the Peter cast. Love that show. Um, but as a podcaster, as a YouTuber, slash as an entertainer, I felt a personal responsibility for helping folks get through lockdown and for helping folks get through COVID. It was never more, more apparent and clear to me the need for entertainers than when we had to all stay home. Whether it was right or wrong, whether you agreed with it or not, what, that's not the point. We were all staying home. The need to be able to have something to kind of take your mind off the stuff the need to have something that people can just laugh at or just be together around people they can rally around as a fandom uh by the way i would also feel the same way about about professional athletes like i'm really glad that the professional sports leagues really strove to keep their stuff going um because people need that you, you need that 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 piece like that's a big part of society there are a few things that we need as human beings to survive clothing food shelter 
right? At some point you need medical care, some point you need companionship, love, community, entertainment's down that list. But when we start talking about quality of life, enjoyment of life, entertainment's a big thing. When you're building a city, you play, you play those sim games, like civilization or any of these where you build a thing, you've got, you've got to put in a movie theater. You've got to put in a, 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 a an art theater. You've got to put in, because your people, you got to put in a park because people have to be able to have recreation to not riot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like there is an important responsibility for people in comedy that, that really, really matters. And the people who can do it well should be doing it. I don't feel that urgency now because we're on the other side of it. If you and I, if you and I were to stop doing a podcasting tomorrow, Jeff, it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that monumental, but being in a, in a spot where it was needed, it felt monumental. Now I say all of that to say, when you and I get these emails, when we get these messages from people who were in surgery and we help them get through their surgery or people who were in, in, uh, in the hospital for six, eight, nine months. And we were, we were a part of their healing process, you know? Like us here, Babylon 5 for the first time. Not some other podcast, like this one right here. Or when we get emails about people who are in familial relationships that are in trouble. Husband and wife, father and son, uh, you know, whatever. And we gave them a point of commonality that they could base a relationship on again. And it saves a relationship. We get those emails. We, we've had a handful of these emails. You sit back and you realize not just comedy, entertainment, what we're doing here, it matters. It matters huge. Like for some people out there, this is the thing. I think of I think of Dan Davidson over at the Trek Geeks podcast who talks about how an episode of Deep Space Nine stopped him from committing suicide. I feel like we've had, have, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, we've had a few emails where people have like been on the verge of, of suicide. Oh, well, we, we had one not too long ago. Yeah. People have been on the verge of suicide and and Babylon 5 is what helped get them through. There was one we got, I don't know, a year ago, Jeff, where and we're, I'm not going to share the full story, but basically this person was in such a bad spot. It was like for a year and a half, they just watched Babylon 5 on repeat. And that was and it. apparently if you just watch it on repeat, you can get it done in about like four or five days. Like just on repeat, like that's literally all this person did. And he did it for like a year and a half. And Babylon 5 helped him get through like and that's not us, but that's Babylon Five. But still, like, comedy is important, and and doing that thing if you're gifted in it is is important. And don't lose sight of that which is actually truly important to go do something that is also important. Just because you see it as bigger and better. That's that's all I got. Babylon Five didn't say that. That was not the message they put out there. They had a chance. Uh, they could have said something like, hey, tell people you love them before you don't have a chance to anymore. That didn't happen. Um, hey, you got to face your fears. Face your internal demons. Face the thing that haunts you from the past to be able to move forward. Yeah, but that's not where they went with this episode either. So I gave this one zero white stars because it didn't really have a message. And it, the ones that it did have, it still didn't even deliver them Babylon 5 way or another. I have two thoughts that come to mind. One is affirming what you just said. Well, one, I, I hope, I hope that it hurt them to say that, right? What you want us to say that our comedy doesn't make a difference? Because I'll tell you two performers that believe they're making a difference in the world are Penn and Teller. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I hope that they were like, oh God, it's a good thing they're paying us a lot because <laughs> this, this is a lie. But it also reminds me of a very specific date, and that's September 13th, 2001. Now, most people, when you say September in 2001, you think of 9-11, right? Because that's a day. Uh, and so, you know, the terrorists, terrorists succeeded on U.S. soil. They, they, they killed a bunch of people and caused, caused what became global havoc for a long time still. But the world stopped. The United States specifically stopped. I have stories, share another time and place, but I was working in the movie theater industry at the time and it, and I worked that day and it was, it was weird, it was weird. And a day I'll never forget. 
a lot of people will never forget that day. But on September 13th, the very first large gathering occurred in the United States. It was in San Antonio, and it was a taping that went live of WWE SmackDown. Mm. And historians have looked back. You know, we, we have the gift of hindsight at this point now. And that moment when Vince McMahon decided and his team agreed to continue with their taping in San Antonio, Texas, two days after the tragedy, after the attack. That was the moment that we were able to start getting back. Right. Entertainment told people that things were going to be okay. Not good, right? Not awesome, but okay. You can show up again. So just echoing what you were saying. On the White Star conversation, the one thing I'll offer and I hesitate to even offer a white star on this one because I don't think I would give it one myself on there. But there was a moment, a, an object lesson, where uh, Lockley's about to agree to sell the station for a day to the Brickiri, which I don't know about you, but if you have a sale with a set end date to it, isn't that a lease? It's like, a rental. A it's rental. A rental. Yeah. Call it what you want. It's a rental. Yeah. So yeah. It's, whatever. But Jakar I mean, comes unless, in. Uh, it could be a sell, like if it's just like a handshake gentleman's agreement, like, hey, we're going to do this and it's going to be official. And while I don't have to, I'm going to give it back to you right the, the next day. Like, that's the only way that I think it actually becomes official. Like, if they could have reneged on the agreement on Monday morning, then like, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, Otherwise, Jakar, Jakar came running in. What? Don't do it. Don't do it. You don't know what you're getting into. You can't do this. So then he sleeps on the floor of CNC and afterwards he's like, oh. I kind of wish I did that. Look how you are. Right. So kind of the lesson I pulled out of that one was, uh, especially when it comes to things from other cultures, don't be so quick to judge. Maybe take a moment and experience that. I've shared on this podcast before, my wife is Lebanese. Much of her family is Muslim. And when we were first dating, um, I was invited to her family's Ramadan celebration. And so with Ramadan, you fast from sunup to sundown. After sundown, there's a big feast. There's praying, there's talking, there's celebrating. It's, it's, it's a beautiful celebration. I like to say that I look forward to half of Ramadan each year, that half being the sundown part of it. <laughs> right. But I got to go and do that, you know, and I came in, uh, you know, preconceived notions about Muslims and the Islam Islamic faith and uh, you know, some were right, a lot were wrong, but in that moment, like I realized, God, this is a beautiful celebration uh, mm. and these are great people and I'm excited to be a part of this family and I, I may not join your faith, but I, I'm sure glad you got, you shared part of it with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'd come in as Jakar, whoa, no, 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 don't do that. You can't do that. Man, I sure would have missed out on a lot. What else are we missing out on? Because we come in with our preconceived notions. So that's a little lesson I got out of this one. I'll give it one white star then. Whoa! I'll, I'll, I'll go up for you one. I don't know, a scale of zero to five, I'll give you one. Still, that's a lot more than I'd... Yeah. I, maybe. I'll give you... I mean, it's a good lesson. I won't elaborate anymore, but it's, it's a good lesson, so you should, you should do that. Well, Jeff, uh, so I rated it on white stars, but uh, hopefully you're going to have a much easier time here. Maybe not. I don't know. Of placing this one in our 100% completely accurate, totally immutable, scientifically designed ranking of season five of Babylon 5. Our current top five is The Very Long Night of Londo Malari. No compromises. Learning curve of you from the gallery and Paragon of Animals. Jeff, where do you put Day of the Dead? This is a really hard one. Here's a question. Can I ask a question before you do that? Yeah. We've kind of pooped all over this episode a bit. Yeah. Did you enjoy the episode at all, though? I actually really did. It went, yeah, like, I, I, last week I did not like the episode. But like the rest of season five, though, like, it's not that I didn't like it. I just didn't like it. Yeah. Like, I did not not like it. I just didn't like it. Like, it was just, it was an episode. You know what my very first note here was? I feel like we're just watching any 90s television show, sci-fi or not. Yeah, I feel like that's where we've gotten back to. It's just any 90s sci-fi show that could ever be out there. 
Yeah, I think last week we got uh, an episode we didn't like to watch but enjoyed talking about for a podcast situation. Yes. This week we got a one. Well, it's whatever. I mean, we've had a long conversation about that from a podcast, but it's stuff we've pulled out. But I enjoyed watching it, and I think for me when I when I look at this and I and I and I, and I make you know it why a, you know why what Byron wasn't in this episode, dude. It's for real. That alone is <laughs> going to bump it up a spot. In fact, that statement alone, I was between two. Okay. <laughs> And, and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, I could, I could rank this based on the assumption that it's a geometry of shadows situation, but also I could be wrong. But that statement, it doesn't have Byron in it, answers the question. Brent, this is our new top. Brent, this is our new number five episode wow. right below a view from the gallery and above the paragon of animals. Fair enough. I thought you were going to say it was top three. And I was like, Wow. That just goes to show how mediocre season five has been so far. That's so true. Ugh. Well, that's it for the Day of the Dead. Next week, we are watching The Kingdom of the Blind for the first time. We've never seen these episodes. We avoid thumbnails at all costs. We don't read descriptions or anything. We guess what the next episode is going to be based on title alone. Brent, next week you'll have to pay the piper for what you're about to say. What do you think? Kingdom of the Blind is going to be about. So I think this is where we get back to Byron and the telepaths, though. Right. We, we can't get too far away from where we left it last week. Um, but I think this one, the kingdom of the blind, this is about Byron solidifying, solidifying and consolidating his power. Um, the kingdom of the blind, I think is a metaphor for the telepaths. They are the blind. And this is about that kingdom. Uh, I think this is really about Byron just gathering power, bringing more and more telepaths to the station. I think Lockley, especially, um, maybe even Sheridan, although Sheridan's probably gonna be a little more on the fence. They kind of start regretting allowing them to stay and giving them the leeway that they gave them here. Um, remember, Sheridan did this because he feels a war coming on with the telepaths from Earth. What if this is the thing that actually starts the war with the telepaths from Earth? Because people from Earth are leaving Earth to come out here to do this. And Psychor is not going to like that. So, um, yeah, I, 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 Sheridan's going to come face to face. He's not going to be able to have these people on his side. They are going to be the the cause of this thing. But it's Byron. This is all Byron. Get ready for a lot of Byron next week, I think. Sheridan's going to be on the side of Psychor, ultimately. Oh, gosh. It wouldn't shock me if Bester was in next week's episode. Yeah. So, how about you? What do you yeah, think? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not far off. I think this will be the first shots fired in the telepath war. Um, mm -hmm. Not the start of the telepath war. Um, but in fact, to use that last thing, I wouldn't be surprised if Bester showed up either. Cause what I almost see is mm -hmm. Byron as King, right? You know, looking all big and whatever. And I literally see him reciting like a manifesto. Mm. This is the manifesto of the telepaths of, of, of my people. It's going to draw those battle lines. Um, and, and then I think we're going to dive into the telepath war, but my, that's my prediction. Here's my hope. My hope is that the telepath war lasts about as long as the Minbari civil war did. Oh, two episodes. Yeah. Yep. And we move on. Yeah. I hope so. Cause I'm, I'm it, remember when like the telepath thing, like was like, this is going to be the story. I'm so done with this part right here. Like either, 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 you know, there's a term we have where I come from. It's time to poop or get off the pot. And it's time for Babylon five to poop or get off the pot when it comes to this telepath war thing. Yeah. Get it done. We're going to find out what happens right here next week. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. Leave us a rating, a review, and please share this podcast with someone who loves Babylon 5 or is just about to fall in love with this incredible series. So, Brent, until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, man, what's up? Um, Why did you say that thing you said before we went on mic? Oh, because it tells me to. Hmm. Well, zitty zoot zoot. Let's get the hell out of here. Initiating getting the hell out of here maneuver. We're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. 
I was dying to know what you thought of this one because of Penn and Teller specifically. Like, did I, did I, did I satisfactorily answer that for you or were you disappointed in my response? I'll say satisfactorily. I, I was almost hoping that you loved it because yeah. I, because then I could just be, you know, the, the conflict that would, cause it was so bad. It was such a it, waste. It was, it was just a waste. It was a complete waste. It, and they, the thing is they went right up on the doorstep of actually having a really good reason for being there. And then didn't Never even did. knock on the door. Not even so. close. Anyway, uh, Jeff, we had a really long Club 65 last week. It was a good one, but it was long. We're not going to do that this week uh, because Dad Dude is Dad Duty is calling me right now. So uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, and I know Dad Duty is calling you as well. So as it uh, does, you guys take it easy, and we'll see you guys back here next week for Byron the King. Bye, King Byron. Here's your.